next panel, which is Borders, Movement, and Violence. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome back our incredible moderator from last year, Ash. Um, but real quick, I just want to make sure, hey, Ash, um, a couple of things. So just um, very briefly, so there's our lineup that everyone has been able to see, but additionally, we have a letter that I'm going to briefly read real quick. And um, it's from the Free Kashmir Movement, which we've been very fortunate to have them be a part in the past as well. So with that, here we are. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, sorry about that. All right. Um, again, from Azad Kashmir Liberation Movement. We are prominently questioning the infiltration of Taliban's and Afghans in, um, inside Azad Kashmir. Why was a separate seat allotted to the Taliban commander, um, Mazhir Shah, uh, in the Pakistan administrated, I'm sorry, administrated Kashmir Assembly? We are intensively questioning the bogus and fake report of the 70% availability of water by administered uh, Jammu and Kashmir minister for local government and rural development um, in Kashwa Farooq Ahmad from PTI. The report is exclusively untrue. In reality, the local Kashmirs are facing extreme water scarcity due to the diversions of rivers, uh, rivers Neelam and Jahan. Talk about hypocrisy. We have most of the times observed the constant support to JKLFM, I'm sorry, JKLFM, um, the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front by Pakistan. But why are they silent over the harassment on them? Uh, Pak administered police authorities seized the literature of JKLF forcibly on the order of higher officials, as we were told. The literature is a draft of the governance system of independent Jammu and Kashmir. Our demand, the UN should take stringent measures on the human rights violations that are continuously occurring only on the Indian administer, administered side, but must focus on the side of Pakistan administered Kashmir. Thank you so much. And I wanna go ahead and welcome again, um, our incredible movement journalist moderator, Asha Guru. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I guess um, let's start with some introductions from the panelists themselves. Um, can we start with um, Nicole? Can Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Nicole Elizabeth Ramos. I'm an attorney. I am the co-director of Al Otro Lado. We are a binational legal services organization based in Southern California and Tijuana, Mexico, and I am in our Tijuana office. Sounds good. All right. And uh, next, can we do Ali next? Hi everyone, uh, sorry, it looks like the screen is super dark here. Don't mean to come off as mysterious. Uh, my name is Ali Wayne. I am an organizer um, with the Undocu Black Network and have been working on a whole bunch of issues over the past couple of years, mostly anti-war economic issues. And my work is really at the intersection of abolitionist work and also immigration works. And I'm an undocumented person myself. So really glad to be on this panel with you all. Thank you so much. Um, I'm guessing, is Abe with us yet? I'm guessing not. Yeah, um, I am. Can you guys hear there me? There we go. So, Hi. You know, I know good. what's going on, Ash. <laughs> good to see you again. Uh, thanks again for the invite. Uh, my name is Abraham Paulo. So you guys can call me Abe. I'm the deputy director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, uh, where we focus on racial justice and also migrant rights. And what that means is sort of uh, working with uh, Black people here in the country that are um, citizens and non-citizens alike. And thanks for having me on here. Good to see you, good to see you. And uh, Tanaya, let's uh, hear from you. Hi everyone, I'm Tanaya Dattagupta. I'm a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of California, Davis. Um, I'm, my dissertation research focuses on climate-related mobilities 
in the Bengal Delta region of Bangladesh and India. I'm also a visiting researcher at CGI Focus Climate Security and a team member of the Climate Refugee Stories. Thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, thanks to all the panelists for being here. Thank you so much. All right, let's go straight into open questions. This is um, the first open question uh, and, I'll, and I'll choose who I'll throw it to first. I'm probably gonna choose the non-men first to talk. Uh, is about the crisis at the border. The, 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 the phrase, there's a crisis at the border. Um, a lot of people mean different things when they say that phrase. Some people think the fact that immigrants are coming at all is a crisis at the border. Um, well, let's start with Tanaya first. Um, what do you think about that, that, that phrase, phrase, crisis at the border? How does that you know, play into the violence at the border and the violence against immigrants? Thanks, Ash. That's a great question. I'm uh, going to address that from the perspective of climate change the, the, in the context of the climate crisis. And uh, we can see that there is an alarmist notion that um, this, this specter of millions of people on the move due to a changing climate that is stoking anxieties of nation states. And the states are responding by stricter immigration controls and border enforcement. Uh, an example from another part of the world, um, the empirical focus of my work, the Ganges Delta region of Bangladesh and India, it's framed as a climate borderland, not only because of its recognition as a climate hotspot, but because this sensitive borderland zone paradoxically connects yet divides the Bengal Delta region into Bangladesh and West Bengal, India. This region is characterized by shared language, culture, colonial histories, and climate-related risks, mostly in the form of sea level rise and intensifying cyclones. A securitized understanding of and, uh, and, and fear of in infiltration of a large number of irregular and unauthorized migrants from Bangladesh have prompted a multi-phase fencing project along this border that runs through an agrarian region and, and a riverine tidal landscape of the Bengal Delta. And in, in this context, um, to, to address this question, I, I would argue for the need to go beyond the framework of people crossing borders that then encourages a rhetoric like crisis at the border to recognize and unpack how borders cross people, as, as, as Ansaldo would say, especially communities and regions vulnerable to, to climate and other crises. So instead of imagining crisis at the border uh, located at peripheries of a nation state, perhaps we need to understand how borders work, what, what work borders do, uh, not only geopolitical borders, but also social and symbolic borders. And, and to do that, we need to realize that borders are everywhere, all around us impacting everyday lives based on where and how we are located at, at the intersection of privilege and oppressions. And, and their effects, which are reinforced by states and powerful institutions in myriad ways, are structural effects that work to reinforce structural and symbolic violence. So, so in a nutshell, perhaps reorient the lens from crisis at the border to, to a deeper understanding of borders as crisis yeah uh, exactly I, I mean i want yeah i want to give nicole a, a, a shot at this question as well too because it, it, i mean there's a lot of parallels obviously between the border uh between india and bangladesh and the border in u.s and mexico is but with fencing and the and and it's all and in india especially with the right-wing party in power it's always you know those damn bangladeshis are coming those damn illegal immigrants or whatever um so yeah nicole um go ahead and take a swing at that question what the crisis at the border this phrase what do you think about that phrase I mean, I, I definitely think there's a crisis at the border, but I don't think the crisis is the people. I think the crisis is the U.S. government's outright refusal to follow well-established federal law and international law. Um, the reason why we have the idea that people can leave one country and go to another to seek refuge is because we got together after World War II and all agreed to this and through various legal instruments. And so the idea that now our border enforcement mechanism is changing what has been decades and decades of 
the ability of asylum seekers to present themselves at borders in order to access a legal process. I think that's the real crisis. And also it's a crisis of conscience, right? Um, in 1939, the US government turned away the MS St. Louis, which had over 900 refugees trying to flee World War II. And ultimately that boat was not allowed to dock. It had to return to Europe. Many of those people ultimately died in World War II. There were a lot of children on that boat. And today, with a closed border under Title 42, um, which was pushed out by the Trump administration and continues under the Biden administration, we are seeing the MS St. Louis every single day that asylum seekers are attempting to cross in order to save their lives. And so um, I would say there is a crisis at the border, but it's one of refusal to follow the rule of law. And it's definitely one of conscience when we are literally expelling thousands of people every month to a place that we know that they're going to die. And so, I mean, with that, um, would, uh, I'm, I'm gonna throw it to the men finally, I guess. Um, would open borders make the crisis at the border? Would it make migration safer for people trying to, you know, just cross these ridiculous imaginary lines that the states enforce with violence. Would, would open borders make people safer? Uh, let me throw it to Abe first. Thank you so much. Um, so would, would open borders make things less dangerous? That's what we're hoping for. I mean, I think we're banking on that um, because the situation is so dangerous right now, right? And, and, I and, think also, and, and lay it out concretely what that would, how, you know, that would make a person's uh, a person safer. Absolutely. So I, I do want to make, make a distinction though, right? I think, like I said, that's the goal is that we hope that it, it would make it less dangerous, right? That doesn't mean that instituting a policy where we start to reframe the thoughts about what a border really is, right? Freedom of movement and land. Does it mean that, um, that that thought isn't dangerous in itself? Right. The thought of saying I want open borders is actually a dangerous thought to those that um, want borders because they want to enforce these borders through violence. Right. And so I say that to just sort of uh, be more realistic about it. Right. Is that it will be less dangerous and, I, and I'll mock that out. Right. But that doesn't mean that getting to a borderless world doesn't mean that they're like things are not going to get violent or things are going to be less dangerous. Um, I want to really talk a little bit about what Tanya had, had really brought up. I think we need to rethink what the border is, right? And again, I think a part of the border is sort of the structural, traditional land. And then there's a part of the border which is more sort of in the ether around citizenship and nationality. And I think that for the citizenship and nationality part, I think that people want freedom of movement and people want You're, you're muted, Abe, you're muted, you're muted. Uh, last thing we heard Thank was you. freedom of movement. Right, um, so freedom of movement, right? And I don't think that a person needs a passport or needs to be a citizen of any country to sort of demand respect and dignity of their livelihood. I don't think that you need to be a national of any country to move about this world peacefully. And I think that as we move towards that, right, I do think that it isn't going to be an easy road. It's they don't call it a struggle for nothing. So I think that at the end, yes, the hope is and, and I firmly believe in it, that it will be less dangerous because of the violence and the danger that we're seeing around borders right now. And then the second part around the border is sort of the traditional land part. And I think that we need to start really thinking about redistribution of land, letting the land be worked by local populations, right? And start to see that, you know, with the effects of climate change and what have you, that we're actually are interconnected and we don't need a security checkpoint to basically rip up the, the, the rivers and the mountains and whatever have you that they're doing right now. So to answer your question, yes, it will be less dangerous. Um, and that's what we're hoping for because of the danger and the violence we see with borders today. And, uh, and Ali, I want to give you a shot at this question, too. So tell, how would you, what, lay, like, I, like I asked Ed, lay it out concretely. What, what would open borders, how would it make people safer? What would it make, how would it make their pe people's trip over to another country safer? And how would it make their stay in that country safer? 
Yeah, well, I don't want to evade this question in any kind of a way. And yet at the same time, I really want to flag sort of a problem in terms of the concept of, you know, like, what do we even mean by borders? Right. You know, there is kind of like the, the, the land borders that all of us, you know, know about. But, um, you know, borders are really spheres of influence. And one of the things that is really interesting about thinking about U.S. imperialism and borders is that as the U.S. tries to sort of frantically sort of push people uh, out of the country and create this kind of fortress USA, the U.S.'s borders in terms of spheres of influence go way beyond the actual sort of territory of the U.S. And I've been thinking about this in relationship to uh, the crisis with Haitian migrants, for example. Uh, the U.S barely sees, you know, sort of a border in terms of like its intervention within Haiti and other countries that it has sort of in imperialist interventions in. Uh, while the U.S. continually asks for people to respect its borders, it continues to completely bulldoze over the borders of other countries. So there's a deeper question than simply creating open borders. It's really trying to deal with power differentials and then having to deal with militarism, capitalism, climate change, all of these questions. So I just wanted to flag that it's, it's not even as simple as creating open borders. It's about spheres of influence and power. Okay, cool, cool. Um, let's start with the, uh, I guess, directed questions. And because uh, we're supposed to do a third question, how can people engage in resistance and stuff like that? But I kind of want that question to permeate the rest of our discussion and like always, you know, kind of throw in how people can take action as well. And I kind of want, I want to start with Nicole. Um, so we, I, I, we can, we can talk about, um, we have concentration camps in the fucking country. Basically we have concentration camps, border patrol does atrocities regularly against people. Um, letting, trying to encourage people dying on the way over here, cutting, well, you know, water bottles, uh, you know, that are left for people making the trip over here. So the word genocide, um, does, does it apply in this case? Uh, and it makes me think about Paul Robeson back in the day, you know, charging the United States with genocide for the treatment of black people in America. Um, tell, do you think it applies here when it comes to USA's treatment of, of immigrants? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way that we treat immigrants today is it's just an extension of how we've treated Black folks, Indigenous folks, other communities of color. It's a, it's a, we are historical architects of genocide. Under the UN Genocide Convention, there can be conditions of deprivation that are so stark that, that they can fall under the definition of genocide, as well as forced transfer of children from one population to another can also be considered genocide. And what we have had at the border for the last several years is obviously we've had family separation, forced transfer of children. Um, and we've also had these conditions of deprivation that are created by policies that come out of both Democratic administrations and Republican administrations designed to keep everyone on the other side. And they're now living in conditions where most people don't have the legal right to work. A lot of people are unemployed. Those that are, are employed are employed in really exploitive conditions. They don't have enough money for basic necessities, food, medical care, and housing. Most of the clients that we encounter are missing meals, going hungry. Um, they have medical conditions that are growing exponentially worse because they don't have access to basic Treatment as migrants often have to rely on a, a really spotty patch of NGOs. Um, they're living in places where they don't have potable water, or indoor plumbing. Um, a significant portion of people are living in outdoor encampments. And in addition to those conditions of deprivation, they are living in this state of violence where they're both being hunted by organized crime that view them as really easy ways to make cash kidnap them, extort their families for thousands of dollars, and then release them and rinse and repeat. And then they're also being uh, extorted, kidnapped, physically abused, sexually assaulted by members of Mexican law enforcement and, and the military. 
And the fact that the United States government is aware that all these conditions are created by forcing people to stay on the Mexico side of the border and not giving them access to the asylum process is genocidal. We know that people are going to die. And this has come out in the context of our litigation against the Department of Homeland Security in um, a particular deposition. I remember one official um, was asked, like, you know that by having these policies in place, people are going to die, or you know that people are being kidnapped. And um, without any some, any compunction, um, said, yeah, that's that's expected. So um, I do think that conditions are genocidal. And, and, and like with the, the genocide convention, states are obligated to act in order to prevent genocides. And in a more informal sense, people are almost obligated to act when they see, you know, these kind of genocide acts happening against people. Um, and I get a lot of friends who hit me up and ask me, uh, and we've talked about this before, before this conversation about like, I've had friends tell me, oh, I wanna go down to the border to help. I wanna go right down there and I wanna do something. Can, can, is that a good, tell, tell the viewers, is what's a good way for people to actually take direct action to help people um, be safer, get in the country safer, get across borders safer. What, what are good ways for people to concretely help? Yeah, I would hesitate to encourage people to come to the border because um, it's it's a completely different context. It's highly militarized and um, it's easy to get hurt if you don't know where you're going or what you're doing, unless you have a particular skill set and you're going to be working with an NGO that already has um, context for, for that particular area. Um, there are remote ways to support work that's happening at the border. Um, Al otro lado, as well as other organizations are working to file applications for what's called humanitarian parole to get people into the US for humanitarian reasons, which is principally for them to be able to seek asylum. Um, and those can be done remotely. Another way for people to help is to help people get out of detention. So um, there are people that are still entering without inspection um, and some of them are being sent to detention and they're gonna languish there if they don't have a home to go to with a person in the US that has legal authorization to work or is a US citizen. And some people are coming um, just by themselves. They don't have contacts in the US. And the only thing that's standing in the way of them and living as a free person is having an address and a home to go to. So I would really encourage people to open up your homes and at least your addresses in order to get people out of detention and to donate to bond funds, um, particularly um, bond funds that are gonna help people that are, are in the Southeast, that are in Texas, um, Border Patrol and CBP work with ICE to send people to these really isolated regions, um, particularly Black asylum seekers, where there's limited resources and um, limited community in order to speed up the process of the deportation machine. So it's really particularly important to, to get as many people out as possible. Thank you so much. Yes, free our people. Ali, I want to talk to you. Uh, we just mentioned Black asylum seekers. Um, you deal with a lot of um, issues pertaining to black immigrants, Ali. And uh, let's talk about imperialism. How does imperialism uh, impact black folks coming to the US via land borders? Um, you know, we, we saw the images not too long ago of Haitians getting whipped and getting, uh, even though people don't wanna call it a whip technically or whatever, right? There's a big debate about that nonsense. But um, yeah, how does imperialism affect specifically black immigrants coming to the US? Yeah, and here I want to talk specifically about sort of the Haitian crisis, but one of the things that I want to flag here is that, um, you know, so like I mentioned, I'm an immigrant, I'm originally from Senegal, and one of the first thing that struck me when I came to this country is that this country is a brutal militaristic empire, and most of its citizens don't know that. They're completely unaware of the brutality of U.S. foreign policy. And you can see that definitely throughout the history of sort of the US's domination of Haiti. Because Haiti has actually been trying to fight for sovereignty since its, it, since its, its inception. And uh, Haiti, I believe, is still paying for its original sin, which is that it was the first country to be founded on a successful uh, black slave revolt in 1804 and imperialist countries have been punishing Haiti for that sin ever since the US absolutely being a part of that. 
You know, I think the, the most um, recent example of that was in 1990, finally, after a US-backed dictatorship of the Duvalier uh, regime, the, um, the Haitian people were able to elect President Jean Aristide, who was sort of a leftist, um, leftist politician. And unfortunately, the US uh, participated in deposing him. And ever since then, the Haitian people have been trying to fight for democracy. And the US has consistently, consistently supported uh, regimes that have been oppressive to, um, to the Haitian people themselves. Uh, and so obviously, a couple of years ago, there was on top of all of these social crises, there were um, uh, earthquakes that created catastrophes and Haitian migrants have actually been, uh, you know, fleeing sort of Haiti for quite a while. This is even though we've seen these pictures of sort of black migrants, you know, under a bridge in Del Rio, Texas, this has been happening for a really long time. And the, the thing um, that is frustrating about these images is the way that they have been framed in the US media. Uh, especially conservative media, is when these images were pumped out to the US media, what you, the framing was all of these illegal immigrants are trying to sort of quote unquote cross the border illegally. When in fact, all these folks were trying to do was use their international human rights based rights to seek asylum. And what the Biden administration did by speeding up the deportation of these folks is literally breaking uh, their uh, um, uh, rights to seek asylum under the, a law which was just mentioned earlier on, the Title 42 law, which had been uh, applied by the Trump administration. So you see the sort of like the two headedness of like the cruelty on immigrants, you know, like during the Trump administration, there were a lot of Democrats who were decrying the cruelty of the Trump administration when it, became, when it came to immigrants. But then you fast forward to the Biden administration and they're using the very same law to speed the deportation of these migrants that uh, Trump used. And so you see sort of the brutality of that. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, just, I'll just maybe leave it at that and, and maybe expand a little well, bit. Well, yeah, when we're talking about law, let's talk about lawlessness in that case then, right? Because you wanted to talk about constitutional free zones, this, this idea that the United States' borders all around it, basically, within 100 miles of these borders, Border Patrol basically has more powers to, to stop people, to do checkpoints. Talk about that Talk, tell, and tell our viewers about that. Yeah, and I think this is actually really interesting. So I, like I mentioned, I'm an undocumented activist. I didn't really want to get involved in this issue for a lot of years because I was afraid, of course, of being found out and being deported myself. But the issue came to me. But the interesting thing is that I actually work at the northern border. And when people talk about the border crisis, you know, in the American imaginary, they're thinking the southern border, right? They're not thinking about Canada. <laughs> there's, there's a reason why you're never going to see images of like, you know, white Canadians pooling under a bridge somewhere. Like that's just not gonna happen. The uh, immigration conversation is necessarily a racial justice conversation. It's necessarily about who is seen as, as uh, an American citizen. And that concept is still very much racialized and, and, and centered in whiteness. Uh, so what I wanted to mention about sort of the, the work that a bunch of us have done at the Northern border is that even though the, the Southern border has understandably uh, garnered a lot of attention, the reality is that, you know, border patrol, as you mentioned, has jurisdiction within a hundred miles of the border. And uh, I live in Syracuse, New York, which is within a hundred miles of the border. And therefore we are subject to uh, a border patrol's jurisdiction. And I think it was maybe back in 2006, 2007 or so. Like I said, I hadn't done any work on immigrant rights work. And I just started hearing just what I considered horror stories of people coming to us, you know, sharing these stories about how you know, like my dad went to the grocery store like three days ago, we haven't seen him since. Like people were being disappeared off the streets of Syracuse. And what we found out was that Border Patrol with the collaboration of law enforcement was basically racially profiling people and then snatching them up, 
putting them in detention centers, and then deporting them at uh, rapid, rapid rates. And the interesting thing is, you know, we talk about the law all the time, right? Now, there have been agreements that have popped up between local law enforcement and ICE and CBP in order to sort of um, reinforce their jobs. But at the time that uh, I was doing some of this anti-deportation work, there were no such agreements but local law enforcement and what I mean is, you know, police state troopers were still absolutely collaborating with ICE and CBP. So people would be, for example, stopped for, say, driving without a license. And, you know, ICE and CBP would, you know, call, I mean, um, and then police, police would then call like ICE and CBP for quote unquote translation services. And then people would you know, eventually end up in detention and then eventually have deportation proceedings started on them. So there has been brutality at the northern border, especially at like local regional transportation centers with ICE and CBP literally hunting people. And that's language that they use, by the way, which, which tells you something about the brutality of the, the ideology of these agencies. When they go out looking for immigrants, a, a bunch of them oftentimes say good hunting. So that's their mentality, and that's really what we are, we are um, fighting against. And I did want to leave on a positive note, which is that there is um, people power does make a difference. Like I can't tell you how many times, like a bunch of us here have gathered and we have shown up at local regional transportation centers to protest the presence of CBP and ICE. And very often, once the spotlight is on them, they leave. You know, these deportations and this cruelty happens most effectively when there's no spotlight on it, when it's done in secret. Um, so, uh, you know, people power does make a difference, but the brutality at the northern border is just as important as the brutality at the southern border. It's just less talked about. Yeah, I want to talk about some people power, too, with, with Abe. Let me talk. Let me ask you some questions, Abe. Uh, we're we're going to get to um, Tigre in a little bit. But first, I want to ask Abe, um, you know, First, lay out the long-term consequences of deportation, detention, the state violence inflicted on, on our people. And basically, um, what have you learned from your activism um, fighting the state violence? Um, wh what lessons, what people power lessons can you impart on us today? Okay, I'll try. Uh, but um, so, so one thing is I'll, I'll to, you know, I mean, Ali broke down, you know, what goes down for black immigrants in, in the country really well. Nicole, that was great about the border and bringing up Title 42 and, 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 and looking at the southern border as an issue. Um, and I think that, um, you know, from, from my aspect, from the work that, that I do, it's really looking at how Black people or how Black immigrants um, are affected in Black America, right? And I think in Black America, there are things that, that Black people go through in this country that also um, sort of extends or includes non-citizen and one of them being sort of a carceral state, right? Uh, and when I say that, I mean the police, the courts and the prisons um, in general. And I think the immigration system in 1996, like according to the legislation, um, basically centered immigration laws, particularly detention and deportation laws around the carceral state, right? And essentially said that whatever's happening to black people over here in the criminal legal system, that we're gonna make sure that that happens over here in the immigration system. This is where they started expanding crimes that could get you deported, mandatory detention, mandatory deportation. I say all of that to say is like, when we look at deportation, particularly of black migrants, if you look at Jamaica, 90% of people getting deported to Jamaica are people, uh, are black people, black immigrants that have had contact with the criminal system. The same goes for Liberia. The same goes for Cape Verde. There are other uh, countries like Belize, um, even Kenya and Nigeria to a certain extent where 70 to 80% of people getting deported, right, back to these countries are black people that have had contact with the criminal system. A better way to say it is that our deportation journey starts with local police officers. Right. And I think one thing that I've learned during uh, this work for for a little while is that um, the law that that they are enforcing is the law of white supremacy. 
whether it is here in this country or um, abroad, right? And I think that that's what I see a border as, right? It is the border between um, white supremacy and everybody else. And I think that in the land situation, we can see that in the terms of what has happened in Africa and what continues to happen in Africa, right? Is that you start to see that every border in Africa was made by a European in what is now known as the Berlin Conference, right? And so after the African liberation in which African populations was like, we're gonna kick out white people from Europe, right? So that we're not colonized anymore, right? And they came up with the African Union, a charter, right? Which is still exists today. But um, it's really interesting that I was reading the charter the other day and in the African Union Charter, right, this came after the African Liberation Movement, is that it says on one hand that we need to um, push the, the, the African narrative forward, right? But then on the other hand, we have to respect territorial boundaries and colonial boundaries. And the reason for that was that there was great fear, right, that at the time that every little pocket or every small population that was on the continent was going to fight to get their own slice of, of Africa, to get their own country, right, or, or nation state. And that fear, which came from Europe, right, uh, basically uh, is, is now <sighs> that fear of saying, hey, we should probably just respect the colonial borders because we're going to be fighting all the time. Um, but we're still fighting. And I think you could see that in Tigray. Um, you could see that in Western Sahara and Morocco. You can see that everywhere. And what, what, what we are seeing, right, is that um, it might have been a better choice at that time with the African Union to actually be like, you know what, let us not respect the territorial boundaries of colonialism and just hash it out and see what happens. Because right now we have a mess, a hot mess. <laughs> Definitely. And, and I want to give the next five minutes to Tanaya uh, before we do Q&A. Um, so yeah, we talked about colonialism. You were in uh, in India and Bangladesh actually last year, um, and then COVID hit and stuff like that. Just I want to I want you to talk about your work in India and Bangladesh, how climate change affects uh, migration, how COVID and then colonialism, the three C's essentially, right? Um, yeah, go ahead. And Thanks, Ash, and I think uh, part of the the uh, what what I'll talk about. Um, will also be a continuation of what uh, Abe just articulated. Um, so I'll, I'll start uh, with, the, with the first question about COVID. And here, when I talk about borders, I'll be talking about internal borders, uh, the often not so visible borders. And I try to connect that with uh, violence um, that's structural and, and symbolic violence, and then bring the conversation to, to the role of colonialism. So um, I, I mainly focus on internal migrants in, in the Bengal Delta who float back and forth between the rural and the urban. And, and so we see that the rural urban divide um, actually acts as, as a border uh, where we have irregular and unwanted migration to urban areas, which are mainly attributed to economic reasons um, and that uh, serves to overlook climate-induced livelihood loss and insecurities. Um, and then these migrants who mainly end up in urban slums work in informal sector. Um, their labor is deemed as informal. They are um, seen to be living in informal settlements, which are often uh, known as illegal occupation. Um, and, and so through this way, through, through the kind of language that's used and um, that the way they are categorized, um, their existence um, is becoming more and more informalized and illegalized. And this is happening without them even crossing an international border. And uh, these experiences of violence, therefore, as I said, are, are structural. They, they operate uh, through poverty, hunger, marginalization, discrimination. They are constructed as people without value, without worth, um, who are living in, in fear of demolition and eviction. And so, so coming to COVID, um, I 
conducted a part of my field work during, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, when COVID became a pandemic, it was followed by a national um, policy response in the form of a countrywide lockdown in India that was announced and, and implemented with less than four hours notice. And that um, resulted in um, what, what became visible as a result of this is uh, that internal state boundaries in India can act as formidable barriers for, for migrant workers who had to return to their villages um, many of them on, on foot uh, had to cross state boundaries and, and um, the migrants in the Bengal Delta region were also among uh, these uh, return migrants uh, who had to return because they were unable to survive in urban areas due to insecurities related to food, shelter and income. And the migrants who returned under challenging conditions to the, the Ganges Delta region were further confronted by the disastrous effects of Cyclone Amphan that made landfall in the middle of the pandemic induced lockdown. And so they were stuck in a limbo there, um, it ultimately culminated in a livelihood crisis for these people. And, and so I, I want to um, highlight here that despite the notion of a borderless world impacted um, by, the, by the pandemic, um, that that pandemic brought to us this notion of, of a borderless wall, uh, a world, uh, what we see are actually a hardening of borders and, and migration restrictions, uh, new technologies of control and screening through test reports, vaccine cards, et cetera, containment zones in, in neighborhoods, checkpoints, curfews. So some of these examples also sound similar to what Ali was sharing. Um, so these are border-like effects that disproportionately impact some over others, um, like the migrant workers um, in, in this example. And um, this, um, I mean, this um, uh, situation at the, at the present time may seem very far removed, very distant um, from colonial histories, but colonialism has played a key role in, in the formation of borders in the, in the subcontinent that has then shaped uh, post-colonial histories of, of the region. Um, so um, if an example from the Shundarbun is that, um, that the entire colonial history of settlement of landless and marginalized people in this tidal landscape was uh, to serve the interest of um, generating revenues for colonial rulers. And um, there is also a history of separating land from water in this fluid landscape through bureaucratic technological apparatus and through which land was transformed to property um, as a form of capital. And this goes hand in hand with management and control of human mobilities uh, today that colonial policies, laws and practices have cast a long shadow. And, and this is apparent in, in the attempt to control the irregular uncontrolled mobility of people um, in, in this borderland. Um, and I uh, also want to touch upon another example, uh, and I'll, I'll be quick uh, in the interest of time, and that is uh, from uh, Kashmir. Um, and as um, uh, because Jamila read the, the letter at the beginning, um, and the Indian uh, administered Kashmir uh, has remained a contested territory since the creation of this border in 1947 between India and Pakistan. And stringent counterinsurgency measures by the Indian government in response to a separatist insurgency in 1989 has kept this region under a protracted conflict situation for over three decades at the expense of suffering of, of local people. And recently, as we know the Indian government and the Hindu Nationalist Party has revoked the semi-autonomous status of the region, uh, withdrawing rights and benefits, and that has led to um, curfews, crackdowns, arrests, um, communication bans, including internet shutdown, and massive human rights violations. And these examples, um, I'm going to end with this final thought. These examples are a glimpse of a, of a long lasting effect of colonial decisions, such as formation of a border on post-colonial regimes with serious implication for democracy, human rights, dignity, well-being, and justice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Let's go straight into Q&A too. Hey, Ash, we're about at time. Oh. No, 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 no. Uh, we have, I'm sorry, 2.30 to 3.30. We have 50 more minutes. Yeah. 
Bring them on. Yeah, yeah, let's bring on the Q&A. So thank bring you on. very much for those excellent comments. Uh, I would like to remind all attendees that there is a button at the bottom of your Zoom window that says Q&A. If you click on it, then you can type in your question. And then please, uh, we're going to focus on questions directed to the speakers. Comments are appreciated, but we'll focus on questions. Um, and so I'm going to give people a few minutes to uh, to compose a question and put it in the Q&A. But I'd act I actually had a question that appeared in my mind as the speakers were uh, talking, which is we're living in a very post-colonial situation, right? And a lot of the problems that we've spoken about are about, um, you know, first world powers, imperial European powers, drawing lines that just really disrupt the normal flow of people. And so maybe you could go around the table and I just like to know your opinion about the issue of, um, you know, how modern post-colonial governments uh, are renegotiating these lines, or are they ex just accept accepting them as the status quo, or are they doing something to really change these lines to make movement safer? So I'd be very curious to hear that while we give attendees a moment to write a question into the chat box. Okay, let's start with Tanaya first. Let's go backwards. Let's start with Tanaya. Thank you. Um, this is a, a great question. And um, my um, answer would be um, that to, to the best of uh, my understanding, I would say that um, as, as I was trying to articulate that um, there is a colonial inertia in, in how laws and, and policies um, ha have been formed and, and maintained um, over time in, in post-colonial regimes. And, um, and, and how the, the border and not just the geopolitical border that uh, was a result of the colonial uh, project um, on, on the eve of independence of um, the, the Indian subcontinent, for example, um, not just that border, but also other borders, social and symbolic borders are reiterated time and time again to serve um, political interests uh, where communities are pitted against each other, um, where uh, we see laws um, that have remained um, from colonial era um, until until very recently, um, even and uh, we we see uh, that the post colonial uh, power regimes adopting um, sometimes uh, adopting similar um, rhetoric and, and technologies um, to to control um, the the movements of people. Yeah, so I, I would um, that's I, I think in, in a nutshell what I wanted to say. Yeah, let's hear from A real quick. What role of post-colonialism post and immigration and, and the violence that, it, that occurs from each? Um, the role that it plays? I mean, um, I'm trying to understand the question a bit more, but I think, I think um, what I hear is that, are we moving forward, right? Is there any progression happening? Uh, I mean, I think that, yes, on, on, on a very deep level, I think the more that we understand colonialism and, and understand how it permeated um, social economics um, and, and politics, right? So essentially in the context of Africa, I mean, all, all infrastructure was meant to rob the land and rob people at the same time, right? So that's gonna take a lot of work for us, I think, to really understand that like, you know, our human capital isn't just meant through extraction, right? And how much our labor is worth. Um, and I think that when it comes down to migration, I mean, like on the continent, you're really looking at like 30%, Africa hosts 30% of the world's refugees, right? And they're doing it in a way in which um, doesn't, that doesn't make a lot of like media, doesn't make a lot of news, right? But they're doing it in a way, I think Uganda is a shining example of um, a country that's hosts a lot of refugees, right? And so I think as we move forward, I mean, I think we, we wanna say, yes, it's post-colonial, but not in the sense that um, we haven't learned from the trauma or the trauma isn't ongoing and prevalent and, and modern and recent, right? Post-colonial in the sense that um, we know so much about colonialism and that we, we tried to fix our way through it by having an understanding of the trauma that it has caused us, not by just saying this border here, once this disappears, we're going to be okay. It's actually like understanding that, um, that it, it might be post-colonial, but it's not post-trauma. Let me put it that way. Word. Ali, go ahead. Take your swing at that question. 
Yeah, real quick. I mean, I would even dispute that we are in a post-colonial time. I think that we are in, in an era of neo-colonialism. And that's that's the issue. You know, as we're talking about borders and countries and everything, like the, the one country that we all seem to be living in is capitalism. We need to talk about capitalism and how it has disrupted, you know, uh, this our very own concept of borders in the first place, you know. Multinational corporations don't think in terms of nation state, they think in terms of the globe. And this actually ties very much with the crisis that we have in terms of migration, is that, you know, through a lot of these free trade agreements, you're allowing capital, you know, factories to move from country to country to country to basically try to find the cheapest, most exploitable labor as possible. So that's contributing to this crisis of migration that we have. And while we are sort of post-independence, and here I'm thinking about the African continent, African countries, we are not past uh, colonialism because a lot of these new countries are still um, basically um, uh, mostly controlled by larger institutions like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, uh, the WTO, larger organizations that basically benefit multinational corporations. So the, the, the post-independence project was never really achieved. I think that now with sort of corporate globalization, we have this imbalance where uh, capital has all of this power and workers have very little power. And what's happening is that we're pitting workers, you know, against each other in this like race to the bottom. And so, yeah, I, I actually don't even think of, of us as being in this post-colonial era, I think that we're in an era of neocolonialism where, where capitalism is dis disrupting borders left and right. And let's end it with Nicole. Um, tell me, I mean, shoot, I mean, the violence on, on the U.S.-Mexico border is essentially violence against colonized people, Black and Indigenous people. I mean, tell us um, what effect does colonialism still have to this day on the U.S.-Mexico border? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll have to agree with Ali as well, because the amount of money that the U.S. government spends to push the southern border further south up until Ecuador is quite impressive. Um, we give billions of dollars to countries throughout Latin America to essentially stop migration that's coming up through Ecuador and Brazil. Lots of folks coming over from Africa, the Middle East, all over the place, as well as people coming up through Latin America. And uh, particularly um, our client, our black clients that are entering through Ecuador and they're making that 11 country journey to the border, they all talk about having to check in at different camps at different borders and give information to officials from those countries. And oftentimes that information is follows them all the way up to the US and then to the extent that they gave statements which are inconsistent, that is used by the US government against them in their asylum case. We've seen it happen to unaccompanied black children from Mauritania and Senegal that told different officers in their journey up that they were uh, over age 18. And then that was used against them to place them in adult detention centers in the US once they were finally able to cross. And so um, what we see is the US pushing the, the border as far south as possible and giving all of these countries the tools to militarize their border, collect DNA, take fingerprints, follow people on social media. Um, I definitely don't think we're past colonialism. We're in some kind of um, neo-colonialism, big brother state that's trying to prevent everyone from and ever, anyone from entering. And, and real quick uh, to end it off, um, Nicole, um, just Tell people what organization with, repeat it again and tell people how they can get involved, how they can help out. And I want everyone, all the panelists to do that before we go. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm with Al Otro Lado and um, we have lots of both remote and in-person volunteer opportunities, not just for attorneys. Um, largely right now we're focusing on humanitarian parole and trying to get people into the US to be able to seek asylum, even though we are still dealing with the closed border of Title 42. And we're focusing on people who are medically vulnerable, queer folks, and Black and Indigenous asylum seekers who are linguistically isolated. So I would really encourage people to get involved. Um, 
and I'll pass it on to my panelists. Thank you so much. Ali, you're next. Go ahead. Tell people how they can help you out, who you're with, and um, yeah, all that. Yeah, so I'm with the Undocu Black Network, and right now I'm mostly doing policy and sort of visioning work. Uh, but I would encourage people if they want to do work on this issue right now is, I mean, you can see the effects of border violence in our local detention centers. Uh, I think that if you can find a local organization that is working against mass incarceration and also working with, with the affected community, uh, that's what would be most useful. You know, I really appreciated what Nicole said about like, you know, you don't need to go down to the border. Like the, the crisis is in our jail system. So yeah, thanks. Abe, you're next. Um, all right, can you guys hear me? Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Black Alliance for Just Immigration, Baji.org. Um, I mean, you can go there, uh, follow us on social media to, to figure out what we're up to in any given moment. But just like um, Ale said, and, and Nicole to echo that, um, to, you know, where your help would be the most impactful, like Ali said, with detention centers, um, and, and I'll even say that, you know, if you see an individual campaign and what that means is that you'll see a family fighting to get someone released, that they might need a petition sign or might need somebody to show up to either court or the detention center. I feel like individual campaigns are, are, are a really great way for folks to get plugged into by helping stop a, a deportation, but by understanding all of the, the, the work, the love and the energy that, that gets put in to, to freeing a loved one. And Tanaya, end it off for us. Okay, thanks. Um, I want people to, to critically question and, and think and um, uplift stories of migrants, center their voices um, instead of buying into um, state centric, state sponsored narratives and, and really. Um, critically um, think about um, questions like that. When we think of violence and people fleeing violence, we think of refugees, but what about internal migrants who may also be impacted by violent border-like effects and processes, um, their lives and livelihoods impacted by climate and other crises. And so here I would like to bring in another C um, to the intersection of uh, colonialism and capitalism, and that's um, the effects of climate change. And I would further argue to move beyond debates around labels like climate refugees as a category of concern to, to recognize climate refugeeness as, as a critical and emergent condition of concern in today's world. Thank you. Um, thank you for everybody. Thank you. Thank you for the panelists. Thank you for every Jamila. Thank, thank you, you Ash, thank for you, moderating. Ash. Thank you for Plus facilitating. <laughs> Abolish them all. <laughs>